Once upon a time, a dark and sinister tone combined with the stunning gothic imagery to create an unforgettable moment in history. We're talking about that goth phase you went through in middle school. Now, it's all about Diablo today, the wildly successful demon-filled franchise that spawned from one man's adolescent mind. I'm Adam with the leaderboard, and whether you're a longtime fan looking for a little bit of a refresher, or a newcomer looking to delve a little bit into the fiery depths of its history, we've got you covered with our 107 facts you should know about Diablo. For instance, did you know upon its initial release, Diablo was deemed the number one selling computer game? Yep, we've got more good stuff like that coming your way, so let's get started. Number 1. Diablo was developed by Blizzard North, formerly an independent company known as Condor, which was formed by Max Schaefer, Eric Schaefer, and David Brevik in 1993. Number 2. Condor co-founder David Brevik came up for the idea for Diablo while in high school. In those early days, Brevik was already planning out his career in the video game industry, with ideas inspired by games such as Rogue and NetHack. Number 3. Brevik actually grew up near Mount Diablo in California. When he learned the name of the mountain, he immediately wanted to use it somehow. Little did he know at the time that his idea would spawn a massive video game franchise. Number 4. Shortly after starting Condor, the company was hired to work on a licensed game titled Justice League Task Force for the Sega Genesis. While at the Consumer Electronics Show, Brevik noticed another developer was also showing their version of the same game but for the Super Nintendo. That developer was called Silicon and Synapse, the company that would eventually become Blizzard Entertainment. Number 5. Before work on the game even started, and before even Blizzard had bought out Condor, Brevik had created a design document for Diablo. Whew, talk about foresight. Number 6. Brevik said that they pitched Diablo to many people, but they all said RPGs are dead. Then came along Blizzard, who had just released their smash hit Warcraft. Listening to what Brevik had in mind for Diablo, Blizzard decided to publish it. Number 7. Diablo was originally described as a single player DOS game. Number 8. Before developers settled on the hack and slash style combat system, Diablo was originally planned to be turn based fights, which would be very familiar to players of many RPGs. I honestly can't even imagine how different Diablo would have been if they had stuck to their initial plans. Number 9. The team also had an idea for expansions, which they described as Magic the Gathering Booster Packs. So basically, it sounds like they were conceptualizing DLC long before it became as prevalent as it is today. Number 10. The original idea also featured a claymation art style found in games like Clay Fighter, The Neverhood, and Primal Rage, but upon realizing how time-consuming and expensive it was, they decided to go with 3D computer-generated graphics. <laughs> this above anything else is surefire proof that this game was developed in the 90s. Number 11. Diablo was just the working title for the game that wound up sticking. It's pretty common knowledge, but Diablo is the Spanish word for devil, which in turn was derived from the Latin word Diabolos, which means, you guessed it, devil. Number 12. About halfway through development of Diablo, Condor was bought out by Blizzard's parent company at the time, Davidson and & Associates, and renamed Blizzard North. Number 13. According to Brevik, two of the biggest influences the development team referred to when designing Diablo were Warcraft and the Unix-based text game called Moria. Moria featured a single town with an endless randomly generated dungeon below it, which kept experiences fresh every time. Warcraft influenced the game's take on real-life combat. Number 14. Some of the influences weren't even subtle. Diablo's developers flat-out imitate other games while creating Diablo's gameplay. According to Brevik, he actually took a screenshot of XCOM and had the team mimic the tile-based flooring. The team got it so good that XCOM and Diablo are identical in this sense. Brevik has even said that the look and technology of Diablo is almost entirely based on that single screenshot. Number 15. While the team of course had the hardcore gamers in mind while making Diablo, their main goal was to make a game that could appeal to the mass market, which must have been hell for the marketing team. <laughs> Get it? Number 16. The developers wanted Diablo to be easy to use and accessible to a wide spectrum of gamers. To keep the mechanics simple, the team would often ask themselves, is it simple enough that my mom could play it? Or would she even understand it? Apparently their moms were way cooler than ours. If it didn't pass this test, the idea would either be scrapped or reworked into the game over a longer learning period. Number 17. Blizzard North wanted to differentiate their game from other RPGs at the time by straying away from overused Tolkien-inspired fantasy worlds. They decided to make something less warm and fuzzy by taking the genre to a darker place than it had been before with a gritty, gothic atmosphere filled with zombies and demons. Number 18. In part, the atmosphere was pulled together by the game's guitar and synth music, which was all part of the plan to completely reimagine the fantasy genre. Number 19. Let's talk about the music composer for a second. Diablo's haunting 
soundtrack was the work of Matt Yolman, who previously worked with Blizzard North, then Condor Games, on Justice League Task Force, and would later return to compose for future Blizzard North titles. Number 20. Blizzard North wanted Diablo to have a high level of replay value. To accomplish this, they designed the game so that every area outside of the hub town of Tristram contained randomly generated elements, from the dungeons to the weapons to the monsters that appeared. That way, every play through the game would feel new and fresh. Number 21. The designer behind the characters and many of the monsters, including Diablo himself, was created by Blizzard North character artist Michio Okamara, who was originally hired to work on Justice League Task Force. Before that, according to Eric Schaefer, Okamura hadn't even had a job. Number 22. Multiplayer was almost not included in the game at all. During development, their new overlords at Blizzard suggested that the developers incorporate a new multiplayer mode and showed them the newly created online gaming platform dubbed Battle.net, which would allow players to connect in ways never seen before. Number 23. Brevik stated that though the team knew the idea would add a ton more work, they saw the long-term benefits of incorporating such a feature. With only half a year remaining until their deadline, the Diablo team had to go back and recode the majority of the game to work with multiple players. The team managed to hastily incorporate not only an additional draw for players, but what would eventually be known as one of the most important innovations in multiplayer gaming history. Number 24. Throughout a year of Diablo's development, the team at Blizzard North found themselves clocking in 18 hours a day, 7 days a week to get the game up to standards. No one ever said making a game was easy. Number 25. The team cut it pretty close to Diablo's release with bug fixes. Finally wrapping things up the day after Christmas in 1996, the game was released only a few days later on New Year's Eve. I don't think it gets more last minute than that. Number 26. As mentioned, Diablo featured the debut of Blizzard Entertainment's Battle.net gaming service, which players could use to play and chat with each other using peer-to-peer -peer servers. It was wildly successful and helped retain Diablo's longevity as it created a teeming community. Number 27. Diablo's protagonists are somewhat known for being generic ciphers, but this wasn't always the plan. Looking at the Diablo preview found on the Warcraft 2 disc, the game was originally going to tell the story of a hero that grew up in the main hub town of Tristram. The plot would begin with the hero returning to his hometown to find it deserted and in ruin with his entire family murdered by an unknown enemy. He would then set out on a quest to solve the mystery and, ultimately, avenge his family. However, this tale, heavily inspired by the role-playing genre, was not told in the game's official release. Number 28. Due to the firm storyline set in place, along with the Diablo preview, some speculate that there was originally no character classes to choose from in Diablo. Instead, players simply took on the role of a hero who was a class practically identical to that of the warrior. This would explain why he is the only one featured in cutscenes and why, according to Diablo canon, the warrior is said to have killed Diablo. Number 29. There were three original playable character classes for Diablo, the first of which was the warrior, who was proficient in close quarters combat. According to the manual, many warriors once fought for King Leoric, but upon his downfall, sought out ways to utilize their skills elsewhere, including Tristram and the mysterious caverns beneath the land of Kanduras. Number 30. Unlike most rogues whom you imagine sneaking around in the darkness with daggers in hand, Diablo's rogue prefers archery. As part of the guild, the Sisters of the Sightless Eye, the rogue ventures to the land of Kanduras to test their skill against the forces of evil. Number 31. The sorcerer, member of the Vizjere, specializes in magic, as you'd imagine. He was sent as an acolyte to Kanduras to study the demons and search for any ancient magics that may lie within the underground. Number 32. There's actually some pretty hefty lore that takes place in Diablo. In short, Heaven and Hell have been fighting for quite some time. Eventually, the three prime evils of the world, Mephisto, Baal, and Diablo, were trapped within crystalline shards known as soulstones. Archbishop Lazarus becomes corrupt and decides to implant Diablo's soulstone in the king's son's forehead. This causes the young boy to become Diablo. This is where the hero comes in and is tasked to take out Diablo, freeing the king's son's body from the demon. Number 33. The hub's town name, Tristram, was a reference to one of King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table, Sir Tristan, or Tristram in Old English. Number 34. The character Deckard Cain was named by the winner of the PC gamer's name in the game contest. Instead of naming the character after himself, the winner named the character after his then newborn son. Deckard Cain's father also received a free copy of the game and a specifically commissioned statue of Diablo. At this current point in time, the real Deckard Cain is somewhere around 20 years old. Number 35. No discussion of Diablo would be complete without talking about the many, many easter eggs that appear throughout the game. First off, when you enter level 16 of the original game, Diablo can be heard speaking demonic gibberish. However, if you reverse this sound, it is revealed to actually be 
dialogue that tells you Eat your vegetables and brush after every meal. Maybe Diablo wasn't such a bad guy after all. Now if you'll excuse me, I have a sudden urge to brush my teeth. Number 36. Diablo's quote, I am legion, is a reference to the New Testament in the Bible, specifically Mark 5, 9. In it, Jesus asks a demon possessing a man for his name, to which the demon replies, My name is Legion, for we are many. Number 37. If you alter your computer's colors during Diablo's boot menu, a few secret messages will be revealed. One of them reads, Buy War 2, and another says, Natalie Portman rocks, which is a little odd because she was only around 15 when the game launched. Number 38. Finding hidden secrets became a major part of playing Diablo. In part due to Battle.net and how easy it was to communicate with other players, many rumors began to spread including the famous secret cow level. The idea spread that clicking a certain cow in Tristram a specific number of times would open a portal to a hidden realm. This rumor was of course false, for now. Ooh, foreshadowing. Number 39. Diablo's end credits claim that no souls were sold in the making of this game, and honestly, I don't believe that. Number 40. Quite a lot of Diablo's content never saw the light of day. Well over a hundred spells, monsters, and items were cut and hidden within the game's code. Some of these items were eventually redeemed and integrated into Diablo's sequels and expansions. For example, the unused graphic for the invisibility spell was used as the icon for the teleport spell in Diablo 2. Number 41. Another noteworthy item cut from the final game was the Map of the Stars, which foretold the moment in time when Diablo would regain his full power. In other words, the game originally had a time limit of sorts. The longer it took you to confront Diablo, the more powerful and difficult to defeat he became. The developers revoked this feature when they realized it punished people for questing and exploring the world. This may explain why Diablo is somewhat of a pushover, as time was programmed to affect Diablo's strength. Number 42. Diablo contains four unused cinematics deep within the game's files. The first is an introduction to the Butcher, which may have been cut for its gruesome nature. The second was a scene featuring the aforementioned Map of the Stars, and the final two scenes that were cut were alternate and endings for the rogue and sorcerer classes when they finally kill Diablo. Number 43. Diablo Hellfire was released in 1997. While Hellfire is an official expansion, it was not developed by Blizzard North. It was created by Synergistic Software and published by Sierra with development only lasting a couple of months. Number 44. Hellfire implemented a lot of the content that was cut from the base game of Diablo. This included the resurrection of many of the enemies introduced in the expansion, which were actually unused characters taken from the original game's enemy database. Number 45. Another addition in Diablo Hellfire was a new class called the Monk, who had a high attack speed and used a staff. Number 46. There were also two unfinished classes introduced in the game, which could only be added in by editing the command.txt file. Those classes include the Barbarian and the Bard, which acted more like a rogue than any bird I've ever seen. Number 47. Diablo, not Hellfire, was ported to the Sony PlayStation in 1998 by Electronic Arts. Number 48. Upon release, Diablo was named the number one selling computer game and was crowned Game of the Year by many, including Computer Gaming World. Number 49. By August of 2001, the original Diablo had sold over 2.5 million copies. Number 50. In 2007, it was discovered that a port of Diablo was planned for the Nintendo Game Boy, but never got any further than a small tech demo. The port was never officially announced or even mentioned by Blizzard, but thanks to the internet, word got out and now you can even see what such a port would have looked like. Oh man, part of me really wishes they would have gone through with this release. Number 51. After Diablo's release, the team took a much needed break while kicking around ideas for future releases. At first, Diablo 2 wasn't even mentioned. They knew it was inevitable, but they thought about other options before coming to the realization. Number 52. Development on Diablo 2 began three months after the original Diablo was released. Work on a highly anticipated sequel spanned about three years and the game was finally released on June 29, 2000. Number 53. The original staff of Diablo consisted of just around 15 people, but by the time Diablo 2 was in the works, that number had more than doubled to around 45. Number 54. Unlike the first Diablo, Diablo 2 was built from the ground up with online multiplayer in mind. Improvements made to Battle.net allowed players to experience the entire game together cooperatively, as opposed to just select portions like the original Diablo. Number 55. 
The biggest update made to Battle.net between Diablo and Diablo 2 was the online services transition from peer-to-peer -peer into a client server. One huge reason behind this change was Blizzard North's desire to eliminate the hacking and cheating that hurt the experiences of many players in the first Diablo. People still cheated in Diablo 2 regardless of this change. That being said, one of the major characteristics of Blizzard games that separated them from a lot of developers at the time was the fact that they continued to support their games long after release, updating them with patches to fix bugs or or glitches. Of course, this act of game maintenance is pretty much mandatory nowadays. Number 56. According to Eric Schaefer, the sequel never had a complete design document during development. They just kinda made things up and gradually added new features as they went along with the overall goal of improving upon every aspect of the original game. Which is exactly how I tackled all my papers in high school. Number 57. It was during Diablo 2's development that Blizzard North and Blizzard began to butt heads a bit. These creative scuffles were what eventually formed Blizzard Strike Teams, which were a group of designers not working on a certain game that come in and act as sort of a small council, giving opinions on what they thought should be implemented or altered in said game. These strike teams became commonplace for all future Blizzard titles. This wasn't just a way for Blizzard to micromanage Blizzard North either. It was a two-sided street. Eric Schaefer was actually part of the World of Warcraft strike team. Number 58. Prior to Blizzard's involvement in Diablo 2, Blizzard North didn't really have a story. All they knew is that the game would revolve around the player tracking down the warrior from the first game, who had taken on the responsibility of controlling Diablo's Soulstone. Number 59. The cinematics for Diablo 2 were created by Blizzard's film department, and in doing so, they basically invented the story that would be used, because Blizzard North still didn't have anything. Eric Schaefer recalls this time being quite contentious, but in the end, it just so happened to work. If it were just me, he said, it wouldn't have had a rich story at all. Number 60. This wasn't the first time Blizzard had helped out the Diablo team with their story. They were actually the ones that created the ending cinematic for the original Diablo, in which the hero takes Diablo's soul stone and jams it into his forehead. But again, there was some contention. Blizzard North hadn't been told about this ending, and they were only given a month before the game was to ship, which gave them very little time to oppose it. Number 61. For Diablo 2 cinematics, the crew filmed a number of scenes as references for the CG animation. When filming, unintended elements like dust got into some of the shots. The crew loved it so much that they implemented these elements into the final cinematics. Number 62. Diablo 2 cinematics were shown in third-person flashback sequences to tell the game's story from a different perspective, the player wouldn't find in the game itself. But the choice was ultimately made because Blizzard didn't have the time or technology to make five different versions of each cutscene for each playable character. Number 62. The tavern shown during Diablo 2's prologue was supposed to be an opium den, but that was revoked to tone things down a bit. Number 64. A clip in Diablo 2's prologue shows an army of skeletons in front of a fiery backdrop, which is a reference to the 1963 film Jason and the Argonauts. Number 65. Act 4 cinematic was the final Diablo 2 cinematic to be completed, mostly due to the debate amongst the developers over which demons would appear in it. Number 66. In that same cinematic, players see a portal to hell. The graphic used actually contains several screaming faces from the game's staff members. Number 67. Diablo 2 introduced five new New playable characters. The bow and spear proficient Amazon, the dark magic wielding necromancers, the brash warriors known as barbarians, the holy paladins, and the elemental magic proficient sorceresses. Number 68. Diablo 2 also introduced hardcore mode, which makes your character completely mortal. If that character dies, it is gone forever and cannot be used again. If you somehow manage to survive against these impossible odds, your name on battle.net will receive an exclusive color, which is pretty much the ultimate bragging right. Blizzard actually gave the team a hard time of about hardcore mode, claiming it only infuriate players. But Blizzard North argued for it, saying that they'd know what they'd be getting into before selecting the option. Number 69. The game sold exponentially more units than the team had anticipated. Revic stated that they had expected about 10% of the numbers that they were getting. What this meant for the team is that the server set in place for the multiplayer couldn't handle the amount of traffic they were getting, which proved to be near catastrophic. Number 70. On top of that, despite having the server clients which were meant to stop cheating, a gold and item duplication exploit was discovered on the second day after release. Revic recalls the team having an overall sense of, oh my god, what did we do? We've blown it! So for most of Diablo 2's launch period, everything was chaos with emergency fixes being made, and upgrades going to servers to make the game work the way they intended. Number 71. Easily the most anticipated secret of Diablo 2 was whether or not Blizzard North decided to include the legendary secret cow level. After quite some time, it was discovered. Using an item called the Herodric Cube, players could combine items to create new ones. This was 
the key to finding the Cowtropolis. After beating the final boss, the player can combine Wirt's leg with a Tome of Town portal while within the rogue encampment to spawn a mysterious red portal, which led to the one and only secret cow level, home of the Cow King. Anyone else think Adventure Time should totally do a Cow King tribute? Number 72. Diablo 2 was named the fastest selling PC game ever in the 2000 edition of the Guinness Book of World Records. The game sold 1 million units in its first week of release alone and had accumulated 2.75 million copies by January 2001. Number 73. After the release of Diablo 2, Blizzard sought to revisit the handheld market by planning a game called Diablo Jr. for either the Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance. Like the Pokemon games, Diablo Jr. would come in multiple versions, each version focusing on a specific character class. Also, like Pokemon, Diablo Jr. would have an emphasis on cross-system item trading. It was scrapped due to the high cost of producing portable games at the time. Number 74. In 2001, Diablo 2 received an expansion pack called Lord of Destruction. Unlike Diablo 1's expansion, Hellfire, Lord of Destruction was developed by Blizzard North themselves and is considered a part of Diablo's canon. Among the expansion's new features were two new playable classes, the martial arts savvy assassin and the nature bound druid. Number 75. The team learned a lot from making Diablo 2, so the process for Lord of Destruction was much smoother. For starters, the team made themselves a script to follow and that's what they did. They didn't keep adding and adding like they did for the base game. The team says, like many fans, that Diablo 2 didn't become truly successful until the expansion and patch 1.1. Number 76. Some of the monsters in Diablo 2 and its expansion are named after employees of Blizzard North. Colenso, the Annihilator, is named after Blizzard North's former office manager, Karen Colenso. Lord Decease is named after programmer Richard Cease, and Shank the Overseer is named after Diablo 2's character artist, Phil Shank. Number 77. Diablo 2 was meant to have a second expansion pack that would focus more on expanding the game's multiplayer features, more specifically adding in guild halls, which would allow players to have an upgradable location to hang out with their clan members before heading off on their adventures. The second expansion never got past a few brainstorming sessions, however, as the team ultimately trashed the expansion, claiming that the better option was to focus their efforts on Diablo 3. Number 78. Blizzard North began work on Diablo 3 soon after Diablo 2 shipped back in 2000. They continued work on it for about three years before their version was canned. Throughout the game's development cycle, Blizzard North found themselves clashing with Blizzard's parent company, Vivendi, leading to the departure of several key figures including Condor founders Eric Schaefer, Max Schaefer, and David Brevik. The developer was eventually shut down for good in 2005. Number 79. Blizzard North Diablo 3 told the story of the forces of hell trying to take over the High Havens. Leaked screenshots of the original Diablo 3 support this with levels that appear to take place in a heavenly environment which honestly looks really awesome. It's a shame that this idea wasn't taken further. Number 80. According to David Brevik, Blizzard North originally envisioned Diablo 3 as an MMORPG with thousands of players. Brevik actually took this concept of the threequel and applied it to his latest game, Marvel Heroes, which he claims is what Diablo 3 would have played like if he had stayed on the project. Number 81. In 2006, Blizzard began work on their latest version of Diablo 3. They did not use any of the assets Blizzard North produced, ultimately starting the project from scratch. Number 82. Diablo 3 was internally referred to as Project Hydra, before it was officially announced. There was a lot of speculation as to what it could be amongst the gaming community, including a new World of Warcraft expansion. Number 83. Diablo 3 uses Blizzard's in-house physics engine. This was originally going to utilize Havoc, the engine used in games like Demon's Souls and Dota 2, but the team at Blizzard decided that they wanted to make their own tools, so they had full control. Number 84. Diablo 3 takes place 20 years after the events of Diablo 2's expansion, Lord of Destruction. Number 85. There are five character classes to choose from in Diablo 3. The Black magic casting witch doctor, the battle hungry barbarian, the magic attuned wizard, the deftly trained monk, and the vengeful demon hunter. Number 86. While in development, Blizzard played an April Fool's Day prank on the Hungry for Details fans releasing information on a fake class named the Archivist, who they said would use books and knowledge as their weapon of choice. Is it bad that I kinda wish this had come true? I totally play as the class who murders demons with a quill and paper. Number 87. Player versus player combat, while not a new concept in general, was new to the Diablo series and was originally planned to be part of Diablo 3 at launch, but due to the gameplay not being up to par with Blizzard's standards, it was postponed until a later patch. Number 88. The game had been outfitted with two types of auction houses, one in which players could spend in-game gold on items, and the other which allowed players
players to spend real world cash. In 2014, shortly after the release of Reaper of Souls, Blizzard chose to close both auction houses as they felt both undermined the gameplay. Number 89 Diablo 3 contains two secret dungeons that only show up on higher difficulties, with the entrance having a 1% chance of even spawning. If you are lucky enough to find this entrance, you will be sent to either Development Hell or the Quality Well. Development Hell contains zombies named after the Diablo 3 staff, while the Quality Well contains zombies named after the Quality Assurance team. Number 90 Though you may be saddened to hear this, Diablo 3 does not have a secret cow level. Ugh, lame, I know. Luckily, the team added in an equally hilarious area named Wimsashire, brimming the cute flowers, cuddly teddy bears, smiling clouds, and pink unicorns. Number 91 During the game's third anniversary, however, Diablo 3 devs added in a new secret area, which was a totally new cow level in honor of Kevin Kenai Griffith, who worked on both Diablo and World of Warcraft, and passed away in 2014. It was originally only available for one month, but as of patch 2.3, players can still access the hilariously named Not the Cow level by inserting a bovine bardiche into Kanai's cube found in the Tome of King Kanai. Number 92. According to a statistics spreadsheet released by Blizzard, the most popular class in Diablo 3 is the Demon Hunter, while the least popular class is the Witch Doctor. However, the popularity shifts when players create characters for the hardcore mode, with the Barbarian being the most popular choice and the Monk coming in as a close second. Sorry, Witch Doctor, you're still the least popular. Number 93. A year after its release, only 6% of all Diablo 3 players had completed the game on Inferno difficulty. I was not one of those players. Number 94. In that same year, over 3.3 trillion monsters had been slain, which is something like 470 kills per person on the entire planet. Number 95. Diablo 3 received its first expansion pack on March 25th, 2014 called Reaper of Souls. The add-on introduced the Crusader class, who shares many similarities with Diablo 2's Paladin. It also raised the level cap to 70 and added a fifth act to the game's story. Number 96. Reaper of the Souls contains a legendary potion called Kula Aid, which not only restores 60% of your health, but temporarily grants you the ability to burst through walls for 5 seconds. If not obvious enough, Kula Aid is a spoof of the insanely sugary drink Kool Aid, and the ability to smash through walls is taken straight from the rude habit of the one and only Kool Aid Man. Ooh, yeah! Number 97. The legendary amulet called Halcyon's Ascent bears a striking resemblance to the iconic head of the artist, Dead Mouse. The amulet causes your enemies to jump up and down for 6 seconds, an attribute found in culture of electronic dance music. Additionally, just so Blizzard made absolute sure that we got the reference, Halcyon's quote in the weapon description reads, Raise your weapon, raise your weapon, and it's over. Which is referencing the Deadmau5 song, Raise Your Weapon. Number 98. In China, the Ministry of Culture must approve games before they are released, which can take months just to get them approved. To get Diablo 3 into the hands of the Chinese public before this tedious process was completed, vendors began selling the game under the false title Big Pineapple 3, which phonetically sounds similar to Diablo 3 when translated into Mandarin Chinese. Number 99. Diablo 3 set the new Guinness World Record for the fastest selling PC game with 3.5 million copies being sold in the first 24 hours. Number 100. Within its first two days alone, that number nearly doubled to over 6.6 million, a number I didn't make up for the obvious joke and one Blizzard originally thought they would have achieved by the end of the game's first year, not the first couple days. Number 101. That being said, Diablo 3 was met with some pitfalls at launch, eerily similar to Diablo 2. And just like its Blizzard North predecessor, Diablo 3 aimed to correct its flaws with its first expansion. Which it did. Now everyone is happy and slaughtering loads of demons. Yay! Number 102. One major outcry from fans was the design of the environment, which many claimed the cartoonish and colorful art style simply did not fit into the Diablo franchise. When producer Keith Lee finally responded to the fanbase, he simply said, Color is your friend. He continued explaining that the addition of color helps highlight contrast and compare the game to The Lord of the Rings, stating that not everything is dark all the time. Number 103. Despite the series' reputation as a PC masterpiece, the console version of Diablo 3 proved to be quite popular as well. In the third quarter of 20 2014, it ranked the fourth best-selling console game, number 104. In 2015, Forbes reported that Diablo 3 was the 10th best-selling game of all time, which is very, very impressive feat for a game that had such a rocky start. Number 105. All of the Diablo titles, excluding Hellfire, have received very positive Metacritic scores, ranging from very high 80s to low 90s. Hellfire simply doesn't have a score. Number 106. Diablo 3 is great and all, but are you feeling like you need a heavy dose of nostalgia? Why not play some old school Diablo with some of your friends? The Diablo online servers are still 
still up to this day, meaning the online multiplayer has been running for about 20 years since 1996. Not many online games can claim that. Number 107. Blizzard actually just recently updated Diablo 2 to patch 1.14a, which was the first patch since 2011. The update helped with compatibility issues on newer operating systems, and even updated the installer for OS X. All while thanking the community for continuing to play the game. Thanks for watching 107 Facts You Should Know About Diablo. What's your favorite part about playing Diablo? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like this video, be sure to check out some of our other 107 Facts videos by clicking on the annotations or links in the description. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know what game you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your games, subscribe to the leaderboard, where we help you game smarter.